Namaste. So I was thinking about what we discussed in the last episode of Sri Panchadasi. And how the problems of life really center around ananda, isn't it? Sat, or existence, and chit, or consciousness, we more or less take for granted. And as I mentioned, every sentient being, even animals, know that they exist, and they know that they're conscious intuitively, whether they can express it in language or not. You know, by being around animals, huh? if you've ever had a pet, you know they're conscious, they have feelings, desires, they even dream. So, you know, let's cut out this nonsense that only human beings are conscious. <laughs> it's crazy, no. All sentient beings. Consciousness is the same everywhere. The objects may differ. The senses may differ. The body shapes may differ. But that's just name and form. That's not really a substantial difference. The consciousness is the same. So Brahman means Sat Chit Ananda. Existence, consciousness, and bliss. So we automatically or intuitively recognize existence and consciousness. But what about bliss? See, this is where it gets gnarly. <laughs> what we're doing when we chase after material objects of enjoyment is simply projecting our bliss, our ananda, onto them and thinking that, oh, when I get this thing, whatever it is, nice sounds, sights, smells, tastes, and feelings, or even ideas in the mind, pleasant thoughts, pleasant dreams, what we say to people when we're wishing them good night, isn't it? So we're chasing after these pleasant things. Sometimes we get it, and sometimes we don't. And most of the time, I think we don't. <laughs> but where is that enjoyment coming from? Well, if we look deep in the Advaita philosophy, we can understand the apparent existence of the world, the body, the senses, and the sense objects, is only because of the absolute existence the absolutely real existence of the self. And similarly, the apparent consciousness of the mind, intelligence, the ego, uh, the body, the senses, all this stuff, other people, other beings, that apparent consciousness is only our own consciousness, uh, because we are the self, projected, onto these objects, these bodies, minds, senses, and so on. So then, what happens when we get a desire? Well, I want this object. Is that we burden ourselves with the thought that there is something that is not. Huh? At least in my present environment, this thing that I desire currently does not exist. So I want it. What does that mean? Well, it means we go chasing after it somehow or other. <laughs> and then what if we get it? Well, we enjoy it and we feel a little happiness. Well, what is that happiness actually? It's actually our native ananda, the bliss of Brahman, the bliss of the self, which now unsaddled uh, from all these desires, because now I got the thing, right? Shines out 
and is reflected by the object. See, existence, consciousness, and bliss are all, all together, the light of Brahma. They're not separate. I mean, we can analyze them as separate, but they're not separate. Just like you can analyze a cake, you know, all oh, this flour and sugar and yeast and stuff, right? But actually, they're not separate. They're one cake, right? In the same way, Brahman can be analyzed as Sat Chit Ananda, but actually there's no difference. When you have Sat, you have Chit. When you have Chit, you have Ananda. The problem is we think our chit is blocked by space and time, that we're separated from the objects of our desires. And this creates an actual block. And so we don't see those things. You see, as you think, so you are. It's one of the hermetic axioms. So if we think, oh, I don't have this thing, and so I'm sad, well, then we are sad. Or when we get the thing, we think, oh, now I'm happy, and so we are. But what if, <laughs> what if instead of going through this elaborate, indirect, chancy, you know, risky process, of projecting our desire onto these objects, projecting our bliss onto these objects, and then acting as if our bliss resides in them, when it actually resides in the self. <laughs> what if we simply say, okay, I am the self. I am Satchitananda. So I already have the bliss that I'm looking for. I am that bliss because I am conscious and I am existence unlimitedly. <clears throat> then the bliss is ours. Then the experience of the bliss is there. And the key to this is to not have desires. Well, there's a couple of keys. <laughs> First of all, you have to unload the ego and the mind Stop the thoughts. Stop the inner yakety-yak conversation. And just be without action. You're not going anywhere. You're not doing anything. You simply are the self. Sat. And the self is conscious. Chit. What is it conscious of? itself, Ananda. Because Satchit and Ananda are inseparable. When the self is conscious of itself, it feels bliss. The trouble starts when we load ourselves up with desires and then go searching after these objects. It's a losing game. Because even if the objects are found, they're never perfect. And even if they're perfect, they're still only temporary. So, you know, this material world, this material life, ultimately comes to nothing. Right? Life is tough and then you die. So the real meaning of life, the real enjoyment, the juice of life is in the self. Not in the external world, not in the objects of desire. Huh? Those are unreliable. They do not give the bliss that we're all hankering for. They only give a reflection of it at best. So, if one can learn to simply rest in the self, steady in the self, as Bhagavad Gita says, completely free from all ideas of desires for material things, then the bliss of the self is felt automatically, without effort. In fact, it's that we do so much effort 
trying to enjoy that blocks the actual enjoyment of the self, the self's own nature. So this is the key. <laughs> this is how we experience bliss. And there's another key, a practical key, which is that, now I'm talking to you guys, okay? You have to retain a given amount of semen, usually at least a week or two, or best, a whole month. Don't ejaculate. You can use tantric techniques to satisfy your lusty desires as long as you keep that semen. Then after some time, the lusty desires will fall away. But the same bliss will still be there. This is a deep, deep secret. Only the real mystics know. Huh? Like Ramakrishna. Yeah, I know you guys' secrets. <laughs> but those who practice this, and I was lucky. My mother was a tantrika and gave me scriptures and books when I was young and educated me in the whole thing. And so I always remained in control of my sex desire. And this enabled me to learn things and do things that most kids never even dream about. <laughs> But anyway, if you follow this practice, you will find that after some two, three, four weeks of continence, whether you use the tantric methods or whether you just tough it out, I mean, that's up to you. <laughs> you will experience bliss spontaneously. My Adi Guru always used to say, anyone who remains celibate for at least a month automatically realizes Brahman. At least one lunar cycle, from new moon to new moon, you remain celibate. You take a vow, a vrata, a brahmachari vrata, and you uh, maintain this vow for one lunar cycle, and this pleases the goddess, the moon goddess. And so she grants knowledge of what? of our own nature, our real nature, as Brahman, as the self, as the Sat, the Chit, and the Ananda. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.